Ray Fidel, Think Tech. Okay, here we are. We're back. We're live. It's, my goodness, it's 1 o'clock or a little after 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock rock uh, here on a given Tuesday. And uh, we're having Asia in review. Uh, we're talking about um, immersion programs in language, talking about the new globality of language. And we have uh, our special guests. To my left, Russell Liu. Hi, Russell. Ni yeah. Nihao Ma, baby. Yeah. Whoa, how baby. <laughs> and Ray Tsuchiyama, Ohio. Ohio gozaimasu. Informed citizen. Whoa. These guys, you put them together, it's like nuclear, may I say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so today we're going to talk about language. Because you've been talking about language for a long time, Russell. You've been talking about language and the signs of the airports in Hawaii. <laughs> and we're missing something. Uh, what do we what do we have what do we need and what are we missing well, well I, I from my living in, in China and Asia um, there's a new global standard Ray. I mean I mean not Ray but uh, Jay you can call me Ray <laughs> I, I, I get confused with this. but there's a new global standard and that is that um, in Asia um, the new standard is um, not only the language Chinese but also English English has been taught there for 40 years it's a it's a core requirement so the youth that grow up uh, can speak English, can read and write English. And so that's the standard. Uh, and so the, the, the question that Big 3 raises is, we want to be global. How do we do it? Well, I, I think language is an important key. And for example, we only speak and learn English here. And now the big languages here, the main four languages are going to be Mandarin and Spanish. Aha. Which one would you pick first? Which one would you pick, Ray? Well, since Hawaii is uh, geographically uh, close to Asia, and uh, the, all these statistics point to a uh, rise in Chinese uh, tourists and visitors and, and investment that follow, and, uh, the, and of course of uh, the need for a bilingual uh, workforce from Hawaii to do business in China and Asia, I think Mandarin is, is uh, quite a good, good uh, option going forward. Yeah, what's and, interesting is that Tell me if this is a syllogism or a tautology. Um, <clears throat> Asia is speaking English. Everybody in Asia now speaks English. Um, therefore, the 21st century, if the 21st century belongs to Asia, and I think it does, you know, it's, then the 21st century belongs by reference to English. We, it's already there. We already have that, don't we? I mean, there's no place in the world that doesn't speak. The Taliban, uh, ISIS, they all speak English. They communicate in English. Um, so there's a message here. Uh, however it got this way, the world is now communicating mostly in most places, not only Asia, but it's communi communicating in English. And, and one thing I'd add what Brea said is, is that picked up is it's the language of money. What's the language of money these days? And it's Mandarin. And I've been there for quite a few years, 13 years, and um, as way back when I first arrived in China, uh, Koreans were studying Mandarin and uh, college kids from Korea would spend a whole year studying Mandarin. And now I even see Japanese students, and there's African In students Japan. from Japan coming to China to, to learn the language. So, but which way is it gonna go? I mean, it's a provocative question. Is, it, is everything gonna go to English? Or is everything gonna go to Chinese? It's sort of, it's, it's relative to, you know, economic uh, success. It's relative to power. It's relative to who knows which way the wind blows. But just as easily as you can say, study Mandarin, everybody, you know, we can also say study English, everybody. But the deals are done at the dinner table, <laughs> and, and you're all speaking Mandarin. That's the difference. Uh -huh. And the, the agreements are drafted in English, because if there's an international dispute, um, the, the body of laws are much more uh, developed. Um, especially the Chinese money is going to have They expect that it's going to be uh, English language uh, will govern some of the agreements. But the point is, the deals are made in Mandarin. So, you know, there's still, I think, what, the second largest economy, maybe the third, is Japan. A third now. A third yes. now, yes. because yes. China moved into the second yes. position. But, you know, it strikes me that what happened to Japan? Why, why isn't Japanese as, as, as attractive as a global language? As, as, as popular as a global language than Chinese. Well, uh, it was. Uh, if you go back to the 80s, uh, remember uh, uh, there was a rise in the Japanese yen, uh, the Japanese economy was driving uh, uh, Japanese manufacturing. Everybody uh, looked at the decline of the U.S. Japan is number one by uh, Harvard professor Vogel. There were many things going on. In fact, uh, in, in Hawaii, 
I think what happened, though, that we didn't strategically kind of plan this to uh, deal with the uh, enormous uh, 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 tsunami or wave of Japanese visitors. It just came to be. There was a pool of Japanese speakers. Uh, for example, uh, my uh, my mother worked in retail in Waikiki. She she was part of this post-war you know um, uh, 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 immigration of people who married uh, you know. Uh, uh, like, uh, people like my father moved to Hawaii, and there was a pool of people uh, who could speak Japanese. And uh, years before that, there were uh, many people who studied Japanese. So we didn't have to suddenly begin a program to uh, educate, uh, uh, teach Japanese. There was a pool ready to deal in a duty freeze uh, with the lawyers uh, and, and CPAs and, and uh, all kinds of real estate brokers. There were already a pool of them. And uh, that we kind of stumbled into and did well, but we really didn't plan right, for it. Right, it, it just know. came our way. Right, we yeah. were lucky and we, we were happy with being lucky. But, you know, I don't think we took any affirmative steps no. about this. It yes. just happened. We had an affinity with the Japanese. We had a connection yeah. with the Japanese. So it, it fell in our, in our tracks. However, I just want to add that my sister teaches Japanese language at Farrington High School, a DOE school in, in one of the le uh, uh, less advantaged uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, uh, districts in Hawaii, in Honolulu. And most of her students are not Japanese. They're Filipino, Samoan, uh, Native Hawaiian, and others, Micronesian, whose parents work in Waikiki, and there is an economic incentive for them to tell their children to learn some Japanese that will get you ahead so in, get Waikiki. A job in Waikiki. Right, uh, get, get you ahead in Waikiki, uh, in, in the hotels and so forth. That's an added value. So, uh, Russ and I are always talking about there has, there's an economic in incentive. What is that economic incentive to you know, invest in your child to learn another language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, good point. But what about the Japanese kids in Farrington? Why aren't they taking Japanese? Ah, Isn't that a natural? If I grew uh, up in, in well, a household and we spoke Japanese, I'd have an advantage in school. Well, that's a whole decline of Japanese language instruction in, in, uh, in Hawaii. There used to be many, like the Danny Norris would write about, you know, running for Japanese school before the war. And then, of course, during the war, everything was shut down. The Japanese instruction and culture and religion was suppressed after the war. That was, it's something that the Japanese language uh, never really uh, uh, came out of. And then the 50s saw uh, people like the Danny Norris coming back and learning English to go to law schools, right? Law schools uh, and right. politics and, yeah. and government and joining the big five. That all took English. Yeah. And, and to excel in English made, right. uh, made you uh, a better soldier, a better government worker, a better... Uh, so uh, forget you know, about banker. the Japanese. Well, that, that ha did happen. Uh, and but we can't let Russell off the hook here <laughs> because it happened with the Chinese the same way. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, if I offer a course in Chinese in mm -hmm. Farrington High School, mm -hmm. the Chinese won't go. They don't mm -hmm. want it anymore. Mm -hmm. They're beyond that. They're assimilated. Mm -hmm. They know these, these truths, you know, that Ray is talking about. I want to get ahead speak English. Well, what, what happened there? Well, you know, it's really interesting while we're, we're talking the subject. I was just at the University of Hawaii. I'm thinking, maybe I should sign up for a Mandarin course to keep my yeah, Mandarin right. going. I show up in there. I don't see a lot of Hawaii kids. These kids are from the mainland, it looked like. And so, you know, it, 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 it's part of not only Ray's picked the word planning. Somebody's got to plan this and think down the road. That's why China has uh, had the economic miracle because they planned, even if it was a communist state, they said we're to have our kids learn English um, and start from first grade. So that's the language of business. That's the language of law. And I teach at a law school in China, and all my students- Teach in English or in Chinese? In English, mm -hmm. and they're all excellent English speakers, and I have them write in English. And most of, a third of them now, to half now, are going to U.S. law schools, uh, very good schools, Columbia, NYU. Including uh, master's and, and degrees. And, and master's, but now they're, they're doing JD degrees. And all these major law schools, the top 20 are, are going to China to find these students speak English because they get their uh, New York license and they work in the U.S. and they have an understanding of, of common law practice. As well, well as there's a huge law. disparity I think in, 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 the, in the Chinese equation, I'm, yeah, the Chinese come here, they have English, they learned English early, they can cope in the schools, it's not a, a barrier for them. But we don't have a, a population of kids that can speak Mandarin, oh. and they don't go. You know, you can, so many situations where you see that disparity, it's only one way street. Um, and we really have to fix that. And, and, the, and the, the sad thing about it is Hawaii, theoretically, is in a position to fix it but Hawaii has not fixed it. Hawaii hasn't sent anybody, really, of any consequence, um, you know, in numbers, 
uh, to China to learn anything in either Mandarin or English, even though you know you could also go to a school and learn it in English, mm -hmm. like from you. So <clears throat> we're missing something, don't you think? Well, uh, I kind of differ on you slightly. Uh, in the 1880s, King Kalakaua sent uh, Hawaiian students to uh, China and Japan. To Are they still there? Uh, no, they're <laughs> still there. But <laughs> in, a, in a kind of a program, strategic program to jumpstart the economy for Asian exports. So, uh, uh, but you're correct that um, uh, that uh, uh, when I was at Harvard once, at the Harvard Baker Library, I saw newspapers uh, uh, like the um, China Daily in Chinese. I realized there were students taking MBAs who were from mainland China. T the reverse is not true yet. We don't have people from Hawaii uh, you know, going to China and, and becoming you part of that. You say yet, Ray. Yet. What but will it take? It will take an immersion program that takes students from when they're like infants to be immersed in a language and for the uh, two languages to be at the same level. Go ahead. And, and I, think, I think what Ray has touched upon, I think it, it's, it's something that it's a new concept of, of bringing language here in our schools. And it's, it's important because if we're not going to go there, why not have language being taught here? And, uh, and, and I think that, again, the word that we talk about is planning. Somebody's going to have to plan and think ahead. Somebody's going to say, this is good for us. And, and I think the problem is, I don't think it's just limited to Hawaii. I think the fact is, Americans, we have a higher standard of living. Uh, we are very comfortable. We but have don't you think you're a differentiate Hawaii? Hawaii is, you know, a place with a lot of Asian people, you know, families who are Asian. And they, they stand a better chance, uh, I, somehow, of learning these these family languages, but they don't do it, and the schools don't do it. And if you went to DOE and said, "My name is Russell Liu, and I want you to teach Mandarin," or "My name is Ray Tsuchiyama, and I want you to actively get these kids involved in Japanese," you'd have a lot of resistance. They would say, "These kids have other things to do; they don't have time for this, and we're not going to have that program." And so we 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 have left it all behind when. We talk about the Geneva of the Pacific and all that. If we want to be the Switzerland of the Pacific, we really have to have multilingual capability, not just fall back on local language. Can't do that. And, and, and that's very important. That multilingual capability is important because it's a human resource that's going to draw investments. Draw it's investments a, is the operative term. Draw investments. It's a human resource. We talk about the grand ideas lawyers talk about. We want of international arbitration, but let's face it: Do we have interpreters? Do we have people in the finance area who can speak the language of Mandarin, um, where you want to bring these disputes here? And it's a great idea. American companies and Chinese have disputes, middle between the two places. And we're in a culture that's Western and Asian. Great. But you know what? We don't have the human assets. We don't have the resources. We don't have the language capability. And that's very important. That's why if we look at back at the China lesson, for them to succeed, for them to draw investments, they had to make sure that their own people could speak English. In the early years, 70s and 80s, when they wanted the foreign money to come in, they wanted American companies to come in. They had to have, and they planned it that way, to have a working force that spoke English. You know, we had a show on uh, Think Tech Radio and HPR a long time ago, and we had a woman named uh, Ho, I can't remember her first name. Um, it'll come to me, and, and, we, and she was, she's the one who for years and years ran the Mandarin program at Punahou. And we had the, the dean of, um, I don't know, language school at UH. And the very distinct impression I had out of it was that Punahou was doing a better job. More students, more interest, more you know, productivity. And, 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 and I don't understand why that would be. Because um, Punahou is a private school. We can't have that. And if you go to Farrington right now, do they teach Chinese in Farrington? Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm happy <coughs> to hear that. Yes. Uh, I mean, th that's harder because that's not all the, the coin of the realm in Waikiki. Um, but, I, you know, if we want to do, if we want to be globally relevant, we really have to do this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that means we have to get off the standard curriculum and put other things in there and make these kids speak multiple languages. They don't, you know. I mean, you'll have to agree with me that since your day, Ray, 
fewer and fewer, fewer people speak Japanese on the streets. Here. That's, that's correct. Uh, and, and, and in the and, 90s, and, and, when they all yeah. came around, everybody was bellying up yeah. to that, everybody learning, but they're <laughs> right. not here now, and so we don't right. do it. And it's even worse because, you know, people from Peoria, when they look at Hawaii, think that we know everything about China and Japan, contemporary business, technology, products, and experts, and that's not true. Uh, but y y you have an uh, excellent point, and, and I'll give you an, uh, a country that bet the farm on uh, the future, Singapore. And now Singaporeans, oh, they're Chinese, but they spoke Hakka Cantonese more than Mandarin. But they chose simplified Chinese to teach, to read and write. And that's the way of writing on the mainland, uh, mainland China. Mm. So again, they took a long-term view uh, of uh, business and, and developing, um, you know, relationship with, with mainland China. So they did it the Chinese, you know, mainland Chinese way, uh, unlike Hong Kong and Taiwan, which has a different writing system, traditional. Yeah. So trying what Ray says is, why can't we be the Singapore in the U.S.? Singapore is a small place, we're a small place, but they chose to bring that Chinese world there. And it's great for the opportunity, you know, I, as I say to everybody being in Asia for quite a while, the last great opportunity for money for anyone in the globe is the Chinese. That's where it's going to be at. Um, you know, we cut, there's cutbacks in military here. Uh, there's cutbacks in federal spending. So what do we have to offer? Again, it's the human resources, and it's the people that can speak the language. And, I, and, and, and you're right, because I think that this is a, a cultural environment here that fosters multiple different cultures, bicultural. À ce point, nous prenons <laughs> un break. We don't break now. Okay. okay. Ray Tuchiyama, okay. Russell Liu, we'll be right back. You'll see. Aloha. I'm Chantal Seville, the host of the Savvy Chick Show, which you can watch every Wednesday at 11 a.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. On the Savvy Chick Show, we are all about inspiring and empowering women and girls to be the best they can be by having amazing guests from all around the world. So we hope you'll join us every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. We're back. And Ray was saying during the break, where he went to school, they spoke multiple languages, <laughs> like five languages for the dean of the school, No, right? no, no. Uh, I'm referring to the early 20th century, uh, the, the Fern Elementary, uh, uh, Mayor oh, Joseph Fern. Fern. Elementary yeah, here? Yeah. Oh, yes, in Kalihi. You went to Fern Elementary That's for right. high school? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and, and, but Joke. Uh, and, and Mayor Fern was uh, uh, won the, the first election for uh, what was uh, the new uh, Honolulu uh, City and County. And he spoke, uh, what, what I've read, at least four languages. And again, uh, it was a time when, uh, when schooling was not institutionalized. Remember, the always started uh, uh, to, uh, with uh, uh, Thomas Dewey's idea on the new American. 20s and 30s was a great, vibrant time with mainland instructors coming in, teachers from very good uh, colleges, yeah. looking at Hawaii as people look at uh, um, the Congo. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> developed a third, country. Yeah, yeah. A third world country. Vietnam, and going to Maui. Uh, my father had uh, Shakespeare and, and uh, proms and, and uh, mathematics and Latin at Maui High School, class of 37. So, but it was focused on English. There was no other language except for French or, you know, uh, or Latin at that period. So creating a new American was, was the key there. And what is the, w but we're in the 21st century. What is the new American today? Yeah. He's not multilingual. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Well, that, just to add what Ray's talking about, the reality today is, is that the new America is changing. The new America includes groups of people that historically, you know, were not there. Now the Hispanic populations rise, so Spanish is important. But then, you know, I think getting boiling down to this, I think there's a really answer we can look into of a small place in Minnesota called Minnetonka. And Minnetonka has come up with out of the box thinking, and they have a language immersion program that starts kids from kindergarten wow. learning Mandarin. And they're, 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 they speak Mandarin, um, and they're, they learn Mandarin up to the, I believe, the second grade. And in the second grade, then they're 
brought back into English uh, programs. And so um, it's incredible what they're doing. Why can't we do that? We can. <laughs> well, can we do it at the State Department of Education level? Be practical. Ray, what do you think? This is, uh, again, at the top levels of the state, what is the strategy going forward for our society moving forward? To make us special, 20, 30 to make years us proud, tense, to yeah. make us global, to make us relevant, to yeah, make us survive. And, and, and uh, you know, in other countries like Canada, uh, where uh, there are provinces that are officially bilingual, officially in many, many ways, that you take uh, one language up to fifth grade or sixth grade, and then at a seventh or sixth grade, you take all courses, engineering, history, and, and science in the other language. Wow. <laughs> okay. In the other language. <laughs> and, and because that's the only way to learn. Sure. Uh, why is language restricted to just language or literature? Right. right. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, it, why can't you explain physics in, uh, in uh, French or Spanish? In, sure. you know, in, oh, that would be so great. And, and that's and all you do. Uh, that's all you do. But that's in a bilingual uh, uh, province, government. But I, again, why I met people who put their stu uh, children, who are English speakers, put their children in French uh, immersion schools because the government hires only people who are proficient native in those two languages. So there's an economic incentive. Economic incentive. What if, you know, at a certain time in the future, you have to be proficient in two languages to get a state job or a city job? For, for example, and, and that would change the nature of the society. So we have a lot of people who are becoming proficient over the past, what, 15, 20 years in, in Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think that is not exactly what we're talking about, is it? Because that native Hawaiian language is not going to draw people from all around the world. I went to uh, Ala Moana. Mm -hmm. I don't go to Ala Moana much. I went to Ala Moana last weekend, and I said to myself, this place is really global. Every brand you can think of from every major city in the world is here. It's huge. It could attract, it does attract people from everywhere. So why can't we sort of ride, you know, coattails on that and make this an international place where the clerks in these stores mm -hmm. can speak any language? Mm -hmm. Let's become a European or an Asian city and be able to handle every tourist from everywhere. Won't that help tourism? Answer, yes. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes, yes. And, and the good thing about it is that, um, you know, as I, as I travel around the world also, I'm finding that um, many times I can use Mandarin in Europe. Oh. I can use Mandarin <laughs> in places you would not think. And there is interest around the world. And um, so I think it's becoming a uh, language that's becoming much more standard in business. Um, I've talked to people, for African lawyers, um, in Mandarin, and uh, I've talked to Koreans in Mandarin. They don't speak English, but they speak Mandarin. So it, it, it's not only just, it, it's, a, it's becoming a little more- Becoming a, ling a lingua well, franca. And, and, and lingua franca, and, and, it's, and it's, it's happening now. And I think what it really takes here is, is, is planning the right steps. And okay, I, so you're talking about action. What? Yeah, action. What do we have to do? And, and, and who does it? I think we can follow this Minnetonka model. We can start a small program. We can do it in certain schools. Government or private? This, is, this should be in, in the public school system. The private schools can do the same. But, and, and it's interesting because Minnetonka is in Minnesota. The University of Minnesota did some research on that. And they found that these kids that they took in that were in an immersion program taught Mandarin from kindergarten to second grade, then English and started second grade. And by the time they were fifth grade, their, because of their ability of language, their English level was that of, of a 11th grade student. 11th grade student. Okay, but I want to add something. I used to think, and you probably used to think too, that when you're young, it's easier to learn language. But uh, that's not entirely true. You can learn it as an adult also. And why don't we teach the adults too in an immersion program? Yes, and, that, and, and again, I guess it, because adults maybe have more obligations, no time. When you're young, you have the time. And, that's, and, and, and they said that the research showed that when you're a child, you have, uh, you have in your mind system, you have the ability, there's more uh, uh, in your mind that allows more you, open, yeah. more open to learn the language. Well, that, yeah, uh, and, and uh, studies have shown, especially in the New York Times, that uh, uh, being bilingual, trilingual delays dementia. 
also, and that is a great boon. So is vitamin B12, according <laughs> right. to the New York Times. But, but, Today, but, that, right but that's now. a big boon in terms of insurance, uh, hospices, hospitals, all kinds of societal uh, things. It goes back to bilingualism. But, uh, and, and, uh, but I, I want to uh, stress this, and this is the, um, you know, we can talk about thinking about box and about bilingual programs, but I think there's a great assumption, uh, fear, that uh, back, going back in the 50s and 60s, that uh, bilingualism or trilingualism, especially with Hispanics in the US, that it delays English, that, that uh, you cannot speak both languages as well. You see, that's you see, not true. And, and that you come up with people who are uh, uh, not proficient in either language, or you know, uh, Spanish nor English, and that is a consideration we have to fight against. Because uh, whenever you do that, oh, you're in the immersion school. That means uh, you're going to be speaking later, for example. And and our daughter did speak later, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, it, you can develop a, a, you know databases of words in in your mind, uh, uh, two languages and so forth. And uh, there are other people like Joseph Conrad who wrote his first book, Heart of Darkness, when he was 41 years old in English, and that was the third or fourth language. Vladimir Nabokov, English was his uh, third or fourth it's language. A mind, yeah. It's a mindset that, yes, we can do this. Yes, we can be multilingual. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of Europe, all the people in Europe who speak four or five languages. It's not hard. It's, no. not, it's just a matter of saying, well, I have to do this. I'll do it. Oh, we're out of time, you guys. I, oh. hate, I hate this part. <laughs> but since, uh, since you guys are such pros, I, Ray, I want to offer you the opportunity to, to wrap up and to say farewell to our listeners. And uh, Russell will follow you, but could you, would you mind doing that in, in, uh, in Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little too much for me uh, right now. But uh, I, I think um, you, bilingual people like myself, we speak Japanese and English all the time, I think it's very easy to speak two languages. It's not hard. It's not difficult. Uh, it's very hard to interpret because uh, you, you want to be very pre precise in that word uh, because it doesn't exist in other languages. Um, and I, sp I always spoke uh, both languages as a home. And again, um, that's another thing that parents, uh, when they put their children in immersion language, which is outside what they speak, it's a great risk. It's a gamble. It's, it's, it's an investment also. But again, uh, what, how does that child turn out you know, 10, 20 years later? Uh, that is a wholly different, uh, exciting individual who can contribute to society. We've got to build global yeah. kids and people. Russell, can you close and can sure. you give me some Mandarin anyway? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, just want to say that um, I think that having a second language opens doors. It really opens doors um, to the world. Um, you're able to communicate with people. There's a self-satisfaction. And today's world is economic opportunity. It's all about that. And it's really relevant. And I believe that um, by having a second language, you are, are really... Um, living a global world and today's world is a global world. Let's let's not kid ourselves and to be part of the global world We need to be tuned in. Yeah, and that's important having a second yeah. language Yeah, and the other side is if we don't do that We're gonna pay a big price going forward and so are our kids in the future of this state Russell Liu, Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, they're great Asia in review today We've been talking about the new globalism of language right here at home in Hawaii. Ne. Thank you so much you guys Thank you. 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 Thank you.